Uh, okay, AP Environmental. Uh, today, we are going to continue with Unit 5. And we're going to continue, because this is kind of a really big unit. Um, we're going to continue with our uh, discussion about the Green Revolution uh, and all the techniques that are uh, that are used uh, in order to feed, you know, 7.8 billion people around the world. So um, you know, we've already talked about several of these uh, methods. Mechanization, we talked about, that's in uh, one of the lecture reviews. Monocropping, GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Uh, we've talked about pesticide use in, in great length. Uh, and today we're going to talk about irrigation. Um, and, and before we get into irrigation, uh, because I, I think most of us kind of understand what irrigation involves, right? It involves the use of water. So I want to talk a little bit about water, you know, before we get in um, to irrigation and, and some of the different techniques that are used uh, with irrigation, some of the problems that are associated with those techniques as well. Um, but as you may or may not know, there's a lot of water that's on our planet, right? 70% of the earth is covered in water. Um, but you may not know, I mean, and maybe some of you do, um, that 97% of all the water that's on our planet is salt water, which means that it's basically undrinkable water, right? Less than 3% of all the water on our planet is freshwater. Now, as far as that freshwater goes, because there's not really that much of it, you know, I kind of want us to understand where that water is, because we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of where the water is and kind of what we what we do with this water. But of all of our freshwater, 22% of it is under the ground. That's kind of what this this pie chart here is kind of showing us. 77% of all of our fresh water <laughs> is found in glaciers. You know, so it's like trapped in ice where it's in ice. Less than 1% of it is found in rivers, lakes, and wetlands. So that's that might sound kind of surprising, you know, that only 1% or less than 1% of all of our fresh, fresh water is in rivers, lakes, and wetlands. Less than 1% of it's found in the atmosphere. So we do have atmospheric water you know, that comes down to the earth as rain and then evaporates and goes back up. That's the, the whole water cycle. So I do want us to kind of know these percentages. You, know, you should know, you know, 3% of our water is fresh. And of that fresh water, you know, where is it located on our planet? All right. Now, when we use water, you know, we use water for a variety of, of different things. But we can kind of break these down into like three general categories. Okay, agriculture, we use a lot of water in the agricultural industry. We use a lot of water in industry. You know, I'll explain that in a second. And we use a lot of water for, for household needs. Okay. Now, how much water we use kind of depends on where you live. You know, earlier in the year, we talked about like a carbon footprint. Well, we actually have a water footprint. You know, the water footprint is basically how much water is needed to sustain your daily life. Now, I'm not just talking you know, how much water do you use to take a shower? How much water do you drink every day? How much water do you use to wash your dishes? That, that's part of it. But to sustain your life, I mean, for example, you know, whatever you had for breakfast this morning, for lunch or something today, you know, there's water that's needed to produce food. You know, um, if you eat a cheeseburger, you know, that the, the, the beef, you know, the, the, the cow that that beef came from, there was water that was used to raise that cow, you know, on a farm. So again, this, this, this number may sound kind of, kind of high. This is the total per capita water use per day. All right. So it's given in liters. You know, this is my little coffee mug here. This is about the size of a liter. Okay. So according to this graph, the average American 
it takes close to 7,000 liters a day to just to sustain your daily lifestyle. Now, if you live somewhere else, you know, like in Kenya, you know, or China or something, you know, these countries, a lot less water is utilized per day because the average lifestyle of someone living in Kenya, for example, is much different from somebody living in the United States. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, again, how we use water. Um, of all the fresh water in the world, you know, that, that, that 3%, 20% is used for industrial purposes, you know, manufacturing, um, you know, one of, one of the biggest industrial uses of water is uh, the generation of electricity. So every time we plug in our cell phones or turn on a light or turn on the TV or charge our computers, believe it or not, we're actually using a lot of water to generate that electricity. So in the United States, 50% of all of our water that's used for industrial purposes, we actually use it to generate our electricity. So that's, that's a lot. We're going to talk about how electricity is generated uh, in the next unit, but we do use a lot of water for that, for that process. Um, households. So again, we use a lot of water in our homes. You know, this list here is showing us per capita uh, household water use. So 10% of all the fresh water that's used in the world is used just for household reasons. Now, this is where, you know, we're, we're talking about washing dishes and washing clothes and taking showers and all that kind of stuff. But again, you'll notice here that you know, in the United States, you know, we use about 600 liters of water a day just in our homes. That's per person. So if you have a family of four, you know, maybe multiply that number by four. And what's kind of interesting about this graph is that we are not the world's leader in indoor water use, you know, which I guess that's kind of a good thing. You know, Australia seems to lead, lead in that category. Um, but again, I mean, we use quite a bit of water in our homes every single day just for, you know, household reasons, you know, whatever that might be. And, and here's some of those. You know, this is the percentage of indoor water use. So of all the water we use, a lot of it's used for just flushing toilets. You know, over 40% of our indoor water use just in flushing the toilet. Bathing, a little bit over 30%, laundry, cooking dishes, whatever. You know, that just kind of breaks down how we use our water. I think that's kind of an interesting graph to look at. Outdoor use, you know, I suppose this is kind of a separate category, but I guess the big thing with this is kind of geography. You know, like where, where you live probably um, impacts how much water you use outdoors. You know, I'm sure someone who lives in a nice sunny climate, you know, like California or Florida, you know, they might use a lot more water than somebody that, you know, maybe lives in Indiana, for example. Yeah, I, maybe not, but I would, I would probably guess to say that. In fact, there's a statistic here that says the average Californian, Californian uses six times more water uh, for outdoor purposes than somebody living in the U.S. So I think this is a good time um, to kind of just kind of pause for a minute and, and just kind of think about ways that we can conserve water. You know, obviously toilets are a big deal, right? So we actually have manufactured um, toilets um, that utilize a lot less water per flush. You know, this is a pre-1980s toilet. So let's say, you know, like when I was born in 1972, that like you can do the math and figure out how old I am. Um, but in 1972, if you flush the toilet, five gallons of water goes down the drain every single time. Today, it's about, it's a little bit more than one gallon. You know, so, I mean, just the fact that we've, you know, uh, made our toilets different, um, you know, that impacts our water use, which is a, a good thing. That's a positive thing. Conservation means we're saving water, right? Um, here's another one. You know, we see this occasionally. I've seen this in restaurants a couple of times where, um, you know, the, the, the flush, it's not like a little handle. There's like two buttons on the top and one of them says half flush or full flush. Um, I like to call these the pee and the poop buttons, uh, because that's kind of what they're for. I mean, you want the full flush, you know, to go down. You want everything to go down. Uh, but the half flush, I mean, you know, just half the water goes down. 
I don't know, maybe that's a good way to save save water. I don't know, it might be something that we can maybe all install on our homes one day. That might be really good. Uh, low flow shower heads. If you've ever taken a shower uh, using a low flow shower head, you definitely know there's a difference between like a heavy flow shower head. Uh, but again, this is a way to conserve water. Uh, here's a term here called gray water. You know, gray water is wastewater from your bath or shower or washing machine. It's basically another term for soapy water. So we're taking a lot of this fresh water and we're putting a lot of soap and detergents and things like that in it. Uh, and those things can be bad for the environment. We'll, yeah, we'll talk about that at, at a later date. Uh, this one here, I just thought this was really kind of cool. Um, it's not something that you see every day, um, but maybe it's something that we can think about. You know, this is a washing machine uh, attached to a toilet. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, every time you take a poop, you should, you know, do your laundry. But I guess the point of this is, you know, you, you do your laundry in this, and then it generates all that soapy, all that gray water. And instead of that gray water just going down, you know, you're just going right into the sewer system, you know, then it goes into your toilet. So then whatever, you can pee or poop or whatever, and then you're, you know, you're, you're, you're just putting that into the soapy water. I don't think anybody really cares if they pee in like regular water or soapy water. I don't think people really care about that too much, but this might be a way to conserve water, you know, because, you know, you're not, you know, flushing all that water out at one time. You're kind of using it for two different purposes. Um, so I don't know. That's just kind of a neat thing that I saw that I wanted to share with you guys. Maybe something that could revolutionize the way that we utilize our water, help us save water. All right. Now, um, the biggest thing that we use water for around the world is agriculture. You know, 70% of all the fresh water that's used in the world is used for farming. It's used for agriculture. And because we've gone through this green revolution, you know, that we want to you know, feed 7.8 billion people, people, we have used a lot more water in the last 50 years. In fact, it says here that in the last 50 years, we have doubled the amount of water use in the agricultural industry. So if we want to conserve water, we kind of have to really look at agriculture. Kind of an interesting statistic here, one ton of grain. So that's, you know, an amount of grain that's about equivalent to the weight of your car, okay? It takes a million liters of water, a million of these, you know, just to grow one ton of grain, all right? So right there, it tells you how much water, you know, gets used. India, China, the U.S., and Pakistan contain over half of the world's irrigated land. And in the U.S., one-third of all the water in the United States of America that's fresh is used for irrigation purposes. So, again, just some, some data and some statistics. All right, so let's talk about irrigation and some of the techniques. You know, irrigation, again, is this, this use of water you know, that, we, that we use to grow crops where we normally couldn't do that. All right, a really great example of this is a place called the Imperial Valley in Southern California. If you look here at this map, you can see here where the Imperial Valley is. Now, the Imperial Valley, if you look at like what state it borders, this is Arizona, right? And Arizona is like desert, but Southern California is a desert. I mean, this is like hot, dry, it doesn't rain there very much. I mean, this is desert land. But if you look at this picture, this looks nothing like a desert, all right? I mean, this looks like it's this lush green farmland. Well, the reason it is that way is because this land has been irrigated. That means water has been pumped in, and that fresh water that's been pumped in has been used to grow whatever, all right? Now, you might think, like, where do they get the water from? And I don't know, if you look over here, you know, in this, in this picture, this is actually ocean water. All right, which I mean, you can kind of see here. I mean, it's kind of borders the ocean, but I mean, a lot of this water is and this is salt water, so they, they don't want to use salt water to irrigate. So they have to pump in fresh water from a pretty far, far, far away place just to irrigate this area of land. 
All right, now there's four different techniques that we use for irrigation. Uh, I want to just kind of go through these briefly with you and then kind of talk about you know, their pros and cons. Uh, this is called furrow uh, irrigation. Kind of an easy concept. You know, the farmer just like digs trenches, you know, between different rows of crops, you know, which really isn't that, ex in, you know, it's not that expensive to do that. It might take a little bit of manpower, but it's fairly easy. Um, and then they just fill those trenches with water. Um, it's a good way to make sure that every plant gets water. I suppose that's good. But it's only about 65% efficient when it comes to the water use because about 35% of the water is actually lost because it just evaporates. It doesn't even get to the plant. So, I mean, we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're basically going to dig these trenches, fill them with water, but 35% of that water is not even going to make it to the plant. So that's kind of an issue. Uh, this is called flood irrigation. Flood irrigation is basically similar to furrow, except they don't dig the furrows. You know, they just completely flood the field with water. So it, it kind of submerges all the plants. So again, all the plants get pretty much the same amount of water. Again, this is about 70% efficient. About 30% of that water is lost to evaporation. So again, it's not entirely the most efficient process um, because they do lose a lot of water. Uh, this is called spray irrigation. Spray irrigation is basically using sprinklers or some type of, you know, you know, large, you know, mechanized, um, you know, piece of equipment to to not only spray the uh, the water, but this usually uh, requires a lot of fossil fuels because it usually it's usually motorized. Um, you know, they have to. I mean, this thing here just doesn't move by itself. They have to attach it to to something. Um, they have to pump a lot of the water in, so that requires a lot of fossil fuels. And again. It's not entirely efficient. It's a little bit more efficient than the other two. It's about 80 to 85% efficient. Again, they lose about 15 to 20% of the water uh, just to evaporation. Now, this one here is probably the most efficient. It's called drip irrigation. And what they do, if you, if you kind of look here at this picture on the, on the bottom left, um, they actually take hoses. And these hoses are perforated, so there's like little holes in the hose, and they'll and they'll put them under the ground. You can see it up here in this other picture as well. Here's the hose here. This thing might be, it might be a foot or so underground. I don't know, maybe six to eight inches or something. Um, but what they'll do is they'll they'll have a series of these hoses under the ground, and then the water that flows through the hose will just drip out and kind of saturate the soil. So you know, when it does that, it, it you don't lose a lot to evaporation. You know, this is a pretty um, efficient way to, to water your crops. It's also a way that, you know, if, if, if you install this correctly, you know, the roots of all of these plants are sitting right there where all the water is dripping out. So it's, it's like perfect, you know. Um, it also is really good if you're, you're uh, trying to water crops that you don't have to harvest all the time. You know, those are perennial crops. These are things that will grow back you know, every single you know, season. Um, so that way you don't have to disrupt the soil very much with those. So uh, drip irrigation, I would say, of the three, is pro or, of the three of the other, or of the four that we've talked about, is probably the most efficient of all. It is kind of expensive and difficult to install. So it does have you know, sort of some drawbacks to it. All right, so positives and negatives with irrigation. You know, probably the biggest positive of all is that we can just feed the world. I mean, 40% of the world's food comes from irrigated land. So imagine if we didn't irrigate, then we would have 40% less food to feed 7.8 billion people. So I think that's probably the biggest benefit of all of irrigation. Now the negatives, a lot of environmental damage, depletes our groundwater supplies. We'll talk about groundwater in, in, the, in the next lecture, but you know, we don't have a lot of water under the ground and we use a lot of this stuff uh, for agricultural purposes. Utilizes fossil fuels, right? So again, greenhouse gas emissions, if you pump water, we're gonna have to use a greenhouse gas. 
Uh, it can also degrade the soil through two different processes. I'm going to talk about these on the next two slides. Uh, one of them is called waterlogging. The other one is called salinization. Now, waterlogging is exactly what you think it is. It's basically just the soil becoming just permeated with water. You know, for example, here's a plant you know, growing in the soil. You know, you can see its little root systems kind of growing through all the little, little empty spaces in the soil. And then over here on the right, we have waterlogged soil. So you can see all the spaces between the soil particles are filled with water. Now, here's why that's bad. You guys might remember earlier, earlier in the year, I, I talked about plants uh, photosynthesizing, right? And they do. Plants, photos, they're, they're autotrophic. But plants also respirate. Remember, they do both. They, they photosynthesize and respirate. So if, if plants respire, that means they need oxygen gas. They must have oxygen. So if, if I mean, they, they, they get their oxygen, you know, basically from all those cracks and holes in the soil. Now, those are all filled with air. But if you fill them up with water, you know, that displaces the air and then the plant can't get any oxygen. So the plant can't grow. So if you have waterlogged soil because you, I don't know, over apply water and you over irrigate, uh, that can be a really bad thing for your plants. It's not very good. The other big problem with soil degradation is what we call salinization. Um, saline, you know, deals with salt. Okay. So whenever we water plants, I don't care if you're watering it from a can or from a sprinkler or from a hose, the water that we use does have salt in it. It doesn't have very much salt, but it has a little tiny bit of salt. So when you water the plant, okay, it's, you know, the, the, the plant's going to absorb all the water, but any salt, or at least any excess salt, is going to stay in the soil. So what happens when we over-irrigate or when we apply too much water is we get more and more of this salt that builds up in the soil, uh, and that basically just renders the soil useless. You know, salty soils, because of over-irrigation and salinization, end up being very poor soils to use for agriculture. I mean, this soil here on the, in, in this picture, you see it's kind of all white. That means it's just loaded with salt. And, and that's actually very common uh, when we over-apply water to our soils. Um, that, that, salt, that, that soil probably can't grow very much in it, if anything, because its salt content is just so high. Okay? So soil degradation, water logging, and salinization, make sure we know uh, that those are two really big problems. All right, last thing here. Um, I just like to throw this at you because I think it's kind of an interesting thing. It's, it's a sort of an alternative to irrigation. It's called hydroponics. You know, hydroponics is basically you know, growing crops indoors, you know, under like greenhouse conditions. Um, and when we do this, you know, basically, if you look at this picture, there's two pictures here that really kind of think kind of summarize what hydroponics is all about. You know, they have these kind of rows of plants, right? And each one of those plants, if you, you can't really see it, but if you lifted up these, these structures, like you see in the picture on the right, you see all the roots of the plants are submerged basically in in a water solution. It's basically water and like, you know, nitrates and things like that. The plants need like fertilizer. Um, and it's just a, a kind of a different way to grow things. Now, one of the advantages of hydroponics is that it requires 95% less water than like regular irrigation techniques. So it would really limit how much water we used to grow food. There's less exposure to pests because they're doing this inside, so there's less pesticide use. Crops can be grown any time of the year. You know, again, it's all temperature controlled. Um, some of the disadvantages of hydroponics, one, it is expensive. You know, you got to buy the equipment. The equipment's not cheap. Um, sometimes if the equipment goes bad, um, you know, what do you do with it when it's done? Do you throw it in a landfill? I mean, it's, you know, we got to find ways to get rid of it. Um, we have to make sure that even though it's indoors, we have to make sure that it's kind of a sterile environment. 
There's no diseases and things like that that can affect crops. Farmers have to be trained. So there's the education part again. Uh, you know, they have to be educated and trained on how to do this stuff. And again, that could be an obstacle. There's a limited amount of space. You know, you're doing this indoors. You're not doing it on, you know, 180 acres or hectares of land. Uh, and then, of course, there's fossil fuels that are used because you have to generate electricity uh, to run a lot of the equipment. So there is some downfall to it, but there's some pro, there's some advantages too. So it's just another one of these things, you know, do the pros outweigh the cons, do the cons outweigh the pros? Um, I don't know, this might be um, one of the big futures in agriculture is growing more of our food hydroponically than growing it, you know, outdoors, but you know, we'll see. All right, guys, that's it for me for today. Uh, I'll see you soon. Take care. Have a good day.